So today, just like uh, just like every webinar that we do, and and uh, you know, some people are just listening to this. So if I'm going to do my best to kind of describe what I'm sharing with you when I do my whiteboard, but um, the uh, uh, if you're if you're you know, some people just join us for the financial planning part of it. So I'm going to remind those folks at the time to. Uh, subscribe every every day it seems like we're getting additional subscribers and I think that's that's good um, for those of you that want to have these webinars um, live or uh, yeah to see it live and of course uh, I send the recording to you so um, good everybody's saying hello thank you so John's telling me all good here that's really really uh, good to hear thank you uh, we put a lot of effort into this studio for you uh, we're going to be doing some training videos and and I shared with you that we're going to have an education series on our new um, new website so I really want it to be a high quality um, output for you so I appreciate those encouraging words John thank you uh, so our format's going to be the same this of course is going to be recorded so if you don't want to be recorded Sign off now. Um, the uh, what I've learned is the scroll doesn't record, so I think all of you can see your um, comments, but uh, that doesn't seem to record and it won't live out there forever. Uh, now, if that changes, I apologize. Or if I click a button and suddenly it's there, I apologize. But you are being recorded, so if you don't want to be recorded, you should you should get off. Um, <laughs> the uh, um, the format is going to be the same. We're going to go over some slot updates, and then I'm going to have some uh, market updates, and then we're going to do that financial planning topic we talked about, which is, of course, uh, five important re retirement decisions, not four, but five. Upcoming events, we have classes beginning on uh, February 16th, and then another series on March 16th or March, yes, I think it's March 16th. On March 1st, we have a special guest webinar. Uh, so let me go back to the classes. So February 16th, we're out, on the, uh, out, out at uh, Villanova University. So that area out there. Um, we're back here at Holy Family University in Newtown, the Newtown campus. Just about a, I don't know if it's even a quarter of a mile across from my office. Uh, but we're, that'll be in March. So if you'd like to attend the classes or you have someone who would like to attend the classes, uh, please feel free to join us. You'll get notification. Um, March 1st, we have a special guest webinar, and that's going to be, of course, the Wednesday evening at 630, and that's going to be David McKnight. So we, uh, we've, this is kind of becoming an, a, uh, an annual tradition. So Dave and I talk about what's new, what's going on, what's important. Um, and there, it's one of my favorite webinars, if not my favorite webinar in the year. And, and last year, you might remember that Dave took that webinar that we did and then made it two of his broadcast or podcast episodes. So I appreciated that. And very excited to share with you that Dave will be here live on May 16th, but we're also bringing Ed Slot in. So Ed Slot and David McKnight, May 16th in Newtown at the Newtown Theater. That's going to be a really great event. There is no doubt that these are the two thought leaders in um, effective retirement planning space. And it's just going to be so exciting to have them. You know, you're, you of course can have a, um, a copy of their book. Um, they're, you're going to have an opportunity to have the book signed. So that's, um, that's great. And you'll have a bit of time where you are going to have to manage Ed's schedule a little bit, but we've got it all figured out. So, uh, so let's jump into our program for today. Um, I'm going to do a separate webinar about this, but there was a Vanguard study that came out uh, about a week or two ago. I think it actually came out while I was at that uh, Power Zero uh, training uh, seminar in Miami. The um, uh, So Vanguard came out and they said, uh, and I don't have the study in front of me, so I'm just I'm working off a of memory here, but they, they said that, that their expectations going forward for the next decade uh, or so is that they expect... Uh, stock returns to be at about four or six percent. So um, that's that's a big um, and bold statement for Vanguard. People listen to Vanguard; they respect Vanguard. Every time uh, Vanguard has a study, it's it's well reported. So I'm hoping you've seen this. But um, you know, the normal stock returns that people generally reference are more like nine to twelve percent. So dropping it down to four to six is really significant. So we're going to spend some time on that um, study. But, you know, you've got to, uh, in a separate webinar, but 
you know, you've got to start changing your mindset about um, about your investments and what types of returns and really uh, you're you're expecting and then really dig into uh, what are driving those returns or sometimes hindering those returns. So uh, we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit today, um, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention. All right. So let's do our slot update. So hopefully I'm going to share my screen here uh, and hopefully it all goes well. So you should see a little box of me up in the corner, and then this uh, uh, IRA. Uh, these are the the, the slot um, uh, letters. You know, it's so there's a slot report in the letters. So um, someone had Kathy had suggested that we uh, share this with you so that we can um, so that you can follow along. And I love that idea, and I always give her credit for that. So I'm hoping that that's what you're seeing. So unfortunately, you can't raise your hand and there's a bit of a from. So one of the things I do like about Zoom is that it's little there's a delay in when I ask you folks to raise your hand, if you can see and hear me. OK, on Zoom, don't do it now. There's no place to do it. But uh, in on this YouTube flat platform, it's like miles longer, this delay. So uh, just let me know uh, if you can see my screen. OK. Uh, and if you can, of course, still hear me because that was an issue before. So uh, Tom says all is good. Tom, I really appreciate you being on top of it. So, all right. So follow along with me here. And if you're if you're listening, obviously you can't read this, but uh, follow along closely. So I'm going to read this out loud. And this is from my friend Andy Ives uh, from the Ed Slot Group, one of the analysts. And he's writing about IRA RMD age made easy. So we've talked about this before. And when I first did my um, key elements of the SECURE Act or key items from the SECURE Act 2.0. Uh, I talked about these uh, dates of birth, you know, with the, the year that you were born, but it's always good to review these things because the SECURE Act 2.0 has made things more complicated for retirement planning. There's some benefits for sure, um, uh, quite a few benefits, but it's made things more complicated. So Andy writes, a ton of questions on this topic have come across our desk and we have seen swirling, hypnotizing spirals in the eyes of many of an advisor. I can only imagine what the general public is thinking about the changes to the required minimum distribution age. Since 1986, the RMD, RMD age was planted at 70 and a half. I didn't realize that, that it had been that long, but it was, it was 70 and a half forever. In the past three years, it, it has increased to 72 to 73 and will eventually jump to 75. No wonder there is confusion. When the heck am I supposed to start taking my, start taking my RMD? I will keep this short and sweet to avoid any additional confusion. Thank you, Andy. So I'm here now in this paragraph. Let's get the others off the screen. The age a person uses to determine when lifetime IRA RMD starts uh, is 100% predicated on date of birth. End of story. Yes, the very first RMD can be delayed until April 1st of the year after the first RMD year. The delay gives people a couple of months to wiggle, uh, wiggle room on that first RMD as they get settled into a distribution process. You've often heard me say that I like to think that it gives people a chance to see their accountant. Maybe they realize they missed their distribution and get it done. Um, However, if the first RMD is delayed, you will have to take two RMDs in the delayed year, the delayed first RMD by April 1st, and the second RMD by December 31st. Also, delaying the first RMD to April 1st does not change your first RMD age. So it, it, that's, that's the same as it's been uh, previously. Of course, it's confusing for your average um, a retiree, anybody, but um, that's the same rules as been before. The only thing that's changed is the age. Uh, there is no free pass as such. Use this guide to determine precisely which RMD age to use. So this is where it's. It, it, we have to make it easy. Just distill it down to uh, births from this point or earlier are uh, follow this rule. So age seventy and a half, going all the way back to whatever that was, eighty seven, eighty six. Uh, for births under, or uh, excuse me, so age 70 and a half for births on June 30th, 1949 or earlier. Anyone born on June 30th, 1949 or earlier should have already started lifetime IRA RMDs and is bound by the original 70 and a half RMD rule. Nothing changes with this orig uh, with the original SECURE Act or SECURE 2.0. Continue to take your annual RMDs as normal. Age 72. So this is what changed from... The SECURE Act, the original SECURE Act, not SECURE 2.0, but the original SECURE Act. 
age 72, for births on July 1st, 1949, through and including December 31st, 1950. So if you're if you're born during that time period, your age is 72, July 1st, 1949, through and including December 31st, 1950. Anyone born during um, or on July 1st, 1949, through and including December 31st, 1950, should have already started lifetime IRA RMDs and is bound by the original Secure Act RMD age changed to 72. Nothing changes with Secure 2.0 because you already started taking it. If you turned 72 last year, you had to start taking it last year. Continue with your existing RMD schedule. Age 73 for births on January 1st, 1951, through and including December 31st, 1959. Anyone born on January 1st, 1951, through and including December 31st, 1959, will use age 73 as their IRA RMD age. Note that we need a year to adjust to the new age, and 2023 is that adjustment year. Makes sense. People born in 1951 will all turn 72 this year. No RMD is required for these folks in 2023 because the rule is now age 73. And they won't hit 73 until next year. It makes sense. Accordingly, no one will have their very first IRA RMD in 2023 because this year we are transitioning to the new age. Yeah, and that's we've seen that with a, with a couple clients or maybe even a few already. Now, age 75. For births on, or, uh, on January 1st, 1960 or later. <laughs> we will cross this bridge when we get to it in a decade. Good wrap up, Andy. So I like that. I like these, you know, the, it, like don't get, don't get too caught up. If you fall in this range, nine, uh, January 1st, 1951 and December 31st, 1959, your age is 73. Before that, it's 72. And if you haven't taken distributions already, you're late, right? Um, but uh, I guess technically you could do April 1 of this year. But you, uh, before that, you should have been taking distributions uh, for some time now. So now this is the, is this a mailbag? Yeah. So this is uh, Lifetime and Inherited IRA RMD Rules. Uh, today's slot report mailbag it says it right there. This is from our friend Ian. Um, the question here, I'm right here, this question. If a person turned 72 in 2022 and died before starting her traditional IRA RMDs, required minimum distributions, must her three children take an RMD based on their ages in 2022 and for the next nine years? This goes back to that ultra-confusing problem that the IRS handled us that said, uh, hand, handed us that said some people have to take distributions um, within a 10-year period after they inherit an IRA. Uh, some people do not. So those some people who do are, are uh, folks who they're, the deceased already had their required beginning date, so they should have already taken their RMD, and it must continue during that time. Uh, folks who have not yet, the deceased had not yet taken their RMDs, then it, the, uh, the IRA has to be distributed by the end of the 10th year following the year that they passed. So again, make things a little bit more confusing for everybody, IRS or Congress. Uh, so the answer to this question is no. So let me just repeat the question for you. Uh, must her three children take an RMD based on their ages in 2022 and for the next nine years? So the answer is no. The IRA uh, owner's original beginning date for RMDs is April 1st of the year after she turned uh, 72, and that's April 1st of this year. So even though she turned 72 last year, her required beginning date wasn't actually until April 1st of 2023. So she didn't trigger that requirement for her heirs. So since she died before that date, the children must only empty their share in the inherited IRA by December 31st, 2032. No annual RMDs are required for years one through nine of that 10-year period beginning in 2023. If the IRA owner had died on or after April 1st, 2023, game change, then RMDs would apply in years one through nine of the 10-year period. Doesn't get any easier. So the next question here, if a client's birth date is October 1st, 1950, are the RMDs based on his turning 72 in 2022 or 73 in 2023? The client received a notice in 2022 stating that the first one is due by April 1st, 2023, but that occurs before they turn age 73, which is confusing. Uh, so that's from uh, Wesley. 
So the answer is Wesley, uh, since the client turned 72 in 2022, his first RMD is due for 2022. However, he was allowed to delay that first RMD into 2023 until April 1st, 2023. Most people don't do that. For most people, it's not a good idea, but that technically is the required beginning date. Uh, and that's only the first year. You must take required minimum distributions by December 31st of the year that you're required. Just that one year, they give you until April 1st of the following year. The first year. If he did that, he would have two RMDs paid in 2023, the 2022 RMD due by April 1st, 2023, and the 2023 RMD due by December 31st, 2023. Did you get all of that? Do you understand it? Listen, folks, this is great information, but don't get caught up in this. The You're going to see in a bit that the uh, penalties for R missed RMDs have come down, but they're going to be more prevalent. Uh, it, it used to be widely forgiven, but now that you can go all the way down to 10%, I think you're going to see many more penalties for RMDs. You know, um, find somebody who knows the rules and who can help you. All right, so we're going to just go through this quickly. This is I in again. I usually don't, I don't think I include three. Sometimes I guess I do. But um, uh, th I thought this was great because the other confusing thing about Secure Act 2.0 is some things happen immediately. They go into effect immediately. For some things, it's next year. For some, it's not for another decade. So it just gets more and more confusing. So here's IN again. The SECURE Act 2.0 enacted into law on December 29th, 2022, makes over 90 changes to the IRA and employer plan tax rules. How about that? I thought it was over 100. If that isn't enough, many of these provisions aren't immediately effective. And one isn't effective in, until 2033. This article will focus on the key provisions in effect right now in 2023. So disaster relief. Secure Act 2.0 allows victims of federally declared disasters, such as hurricanes or tornadoes, to withdraw up to $22,000 from their IRA or employer plan penalty-free, not tax-free, but penalty-free. This really uh, focuses on folks who are under 59 and a half and can't draw out of their IRAs yet without a penalty. In addition, the taxable income on those withdrawals can be spread over three years, and the withdrawals can be repaid over three years. So it allows for those payments to be made in over a longer period of time, and you can put it back over three years. That's a nice provision. This provision is actually retroactive to January 26, 2021. Wow. Can you imagine that? So people that were penalized and did got caught up in, you know, um, the, the, the one year per uh, rollover rule. So they're going to be able to have to go back and amend their returns. And that's going to be a lot of work for some folks. RMD age, the first year that RMDs, we just talked about this a lot, must be taken from IRAs was extended from 72 to 73. This change affects anyone who turns age 72 after December 31st, 2022. So if you reach age 72 this year, your first RMD isn't required until you turn 73 in 2024. The RMD age is delayed further to 75 uh, if you reach 73 in 2033 or later. So you know all about the new RMDs now. I could quiz all of you about it because you're all experts after today, right? The 10% early distribution penalty. Congress added several new exceptions to the 10% early distribution penalty for withdrawals before 59 and a half. These include disaster relief distributions, as we talked about above, and withdrawals to those who are terminally ill. Both penalty exceptions apply to IRAs and company plans. Secure, Secure Act uh, 2.0 also makes two changes to the 10% penalty exception for plan distributions made to public safety employees who leave employment in the year they turn 50 or older. The exception now applies to any employee to an employee, excuse me, under age 50 who leaves with at least 25 years of service with the employer. Also, the exception was expanded to include municipal corrections or for forensic employees and private sector firefighters. So, you know, you, sometimes you have police who start very, very young and they'll have 25 years in but not be 50 and they can't access their retirement plans. So that's a good one, in my opinion. Several other new exceptions to the 10% penalty come into play in later years. Roth accounts. How many more do we have? Okay, three more. Roth accounts. Up to now, employer plan contributions like 401k matches had to be made on a pre-tax basis. Now, employers can make their contributions on a Roth basis. This is a big one. This is a big one. So the matching contributions can now go into the Roth accounts. Also, simple and SEP Roth contributions are now available. That's a big one, too. Although Secure 2.0 allows for these new Roth accounts right away, it may take some time 
uh, before the plan administrators and IRA custodians will have them in place. Yeah, it's a big change for these custodians, like when you're talking about the vanguards and fidelities. So they have to allow uh, for these changes to be made. Uh, annuity options. Qualified charitable distributions are tax-free direct transfers from IRAs to charities. A one-time QCD, qualified charitable distribution, of up to $50,000 can now be made to certain charitable annuities. However, these QCDs count against the annual 100000 annual QCD limit. In addition, the limit has been raised on the amount of IRA or company plan funds that can be used to purchase a qualified longevity annuity contract or a QLAC. A QLAC is a deferred annuity that extends RMDs until payments start. The new limit is $200,000 and it's indexed in future years. And finally, penalty for missed RMDs. This is a big one. This is what I talked about. Uh, it, it reduces it down from what it was before, 50%, 50% of what you should have taken. You can go get all the way down to 10%, which is nice, but I think we're going to see more penalties. The penalty for missed RMDs, which was 50%, as I said, has been lowered to 25% and to 10% if the missed RMD is timely corrected, generally within two years. That's gracious, two years. In the past, the IRS has usually waived the 50% penalty if a missed RMD was paid and Form 5329 was filed with a reasonable cause explanation. It's not clear if the IRS will continue to do that. What do you think? I think no. I think we're going to, like, as I said, we're going to see more penalties for that um, because, you know, 50% is pretty uh, aggressive and most people went after that um, exception. All right. So that is the slot report today. So you should have me back. It looks like you do. I'm not sharing my screen anymore, hopefully. All right. Let's talk about the markets. Uh, we'll do that. We'll, we'll hit 1030. Uh, yeah, we're in good shape. So last week, so this ends January 27. So last week, the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was up 1.81. It's up 2.60% uh, year to date and year over year. So January 27th last year, January 27th this year, uh, it's up 1.57. The S&P 500 was up 2.48 for the week, up year to date 6.11. Still down though for the 12 month period, it's down 4.36 since this time last year. The NASDAQ was up 4.32. Big hit for NASDAQ last week, 11.07% for the year. So if we could just stop there for the NASDAQ, I think everybody would be happy. Um, and uh, really across the globe, 1.45, uh, 1.44, 1.40. So positive week across the, the, uh, across the board for stock indices. Even the bonds, so bond, the, the uh, Barclays Aggregate Bond Index, which is where most people have their bond money in that, in, in, in that territory there, uh, was up 0.09% and is up 3% for the year. Still down 8.47% uh, year over year. 10-year uh, treasury was up slightly, 3.50% compared to 3.4. The six-month was up to 4.82 uh, to 4.81. So you can get more interest owning a six-month bond, government bond, then you can a 10-year government bond, and that is what we call an inverted yield curve when you hear that out there. Uh, a lot of talk about earnings this week, uh, the busiest week in uh, the uh, – Fourth quarter earnings earning season um, is about to kick off. More than 100 companies representing nearly a third of the S&P 500 uh, set to uh, report results. Caterpillar, Exxon, GM, McDonald's, uh, Microsoft, Meta, so Amazon, Apple, Google, so big names. Uh, so that'll be, we should actually should have uh, a good list of them already. Uh, Jerry, uh, I'm just catching some... Uh, some questions out of the corner of my eye. Let me come back to that after investments. BlackRock uh, writes that um, this was interesting, actually. So with the printed commentary comes a video, and I was taking notes. Um, so we have some conflicting thoughts again about how the markets are going to perform and um, whether we're going to be able to hit this soft landing. BlackRock says they're favoring bonds right now because they write, we don't see major central bank rates cut this year. So this is what you hear about. Uh, they're not just talking about the U.S. Fed. They're talking about the, the global central banks the, uh, around the world that can control interest rates. Um, so they don't see major central bank rate 
cuts this year. So we prefer to earn income and short-term bonds, high-grade credit, and agency mortgage-backed securities. Uh, U.S. stocks rose and Treasury yields were mostly steady, they said last week. Uh, but declining su uh, consumer spending suggests growth is slowing quickly. Um, we're going to see some uh, policy decisions this week from the Fed and the European Central Bank. Uh, they say they see them hiking uh, rates and holding rates higher for longer than markets expect. So um, it seems to be that we're getting this lift because, you know, we're starting to talk about this sloth landing. That's I'm going to talk to you in a minute about um, and Powers report about this Goldilocks scenario. But um, BlackRock is basically saying, look out, it could get worse before it gets better in my opinion. Uh, and they also said uh, inflation not likely to reach 2% anytime soon. That's the that's the goal of the Fed. And they're, they're hoping they're seeing that around the corner. But BlackRock is saying not likely to see that anytime soon. And they see no rate cuts in the near future. Now, in power, they're talked about the Goldilocks and soft landing. Uh, they said uh, the markets currently. Uh, so what are the markets currently uh, pricing in the consensus of economics? Economists, excuse me, analysts and prognosticators believe that the recent and rapid escalation of interest rates will push the U.S. economy into a mild recession in 2023. So they're saying that's what everybody's saying. Um, but what's really going to happen? The prevailing belief is that the Federal Reserve will continue to push interest rates up until inflation is back under control. And that's annualized rates around 2%. BlackRock just said not likely to happen anytime soon. And Powers laying out their argument here. Um, Economic strength, however, is currently being interpreted as a negative for the market since it suggests the Fed will have to keep pushing up interest rates. So the economy is bringing in some decent numbers and they're saying, well, wait a minute, the economy is still bringing in some decent numbers and we're raising interest rates. When is this going to stop? So they have this Goldilocks scenario that, that you'll hear them talking about them uh, being, you know, the, the talking heads on TV, the Fed, which is uh, the Goldilocks scenario, is, uh, which is what the Fed has been trying to engineer all along, this soft landing. In this scenario, the Fed reduces consumer demand just enough to rein in inflation while not tipping the economy over into a recession. Nearly impossible, in my opinion. And as I've said a bunch of times, if the economists are being um, honest. They'll look back on this and say, we've really been in a recession since the pandemic started. So coming into 2023, it appeared that inflation was remaining stubbornly high and the Fed was going to have to maintain a restrictive monetary policy, continue to raise rates aggressively. Meanwhile, the economy is showing signs of re weakness. Um, we saw a slumping housing market, declining real uh, retail sales, and declining corporate profit margins. Now, uh, January, we had a string of economic inflation and corporate earnings data um, that was much better, right? This, uh, uh, some corporate earnings came in higher, retail numbers came in better than expected. Uh, and so now people are um, thinking maybe we could, the Fed can pull it off. So let me just see here. Uh, and even inflation, right? So over the summer, inflation was at 41-year highs. That's starting to ease a little bit, still outrageously high, of course. But um, uh, we're getting from a power that they're saying the Fed might be able to do this Goldilocks scenario. So I always think that's that's interesting how you have, you know, very bright people, but just with two different thoughts on the matter. All right. So let me see. Let me check in with questions here. So again, if you see me looking around, I've got three different monitors going here, and I with this YouTube and um, stuff, I, I may need a fourth one, believe it or not. Uh, Jerry's asking, are there any changes to 72T rules? Jerry, I can't remember. I, I, uh, 72, 72T is when you can, um, if you, you want to start withdrawing funds out of your um, IRAs and you're under 59 and a half, there is a uh, IRS section 72T um, that allows you to, to take equal and um, equal payments, and they have to be for a period of time. Um, I don't, uh, Jerry. I kind of remember that there might have been something about it, but I'm not sure. But I can, I can check on that. If you send me an email, I'll talk about it next time. Um, and thank you for your comments. Okay, so we're going to switch to our financial planning topic, and I'm going to try to keep it within the time. But you all know me, so um, you're going to see me looking down a bit because I'm going to be writing on my screen. But today's uh, financial planning topic is for 
not four, we're going to cross this out, five important retirement decisions. So it looks like you can all see my screen here. Yeah. So the first question, of course, is when. When are you considering retiring? Now, this, these all might, some of you might say, this seems so um, obvious, Mark. How can you even be bringing this to us as a certified financial planner and the expert you are? But it's not obvious to everybody, right? So, of course, one of the first questions, and, and honestly, this is why it flipped from four to five. I wasn't going to tell you that, but I'm sharing it with you. Um, I had where and when, but I uh, I thought when des deserved its own category. But it's a decision you have to make. It's not that it, we're talking about important decisions. So some people might have it in their head that, hey, I want to retire at 65. And they've got this thought of, uh, of uh, you know, some of the other areas, you know, how much they're going to need to spend, where the money's coming from. But then they sit down and they, they you know, they, they do their they do their plan, uh, hopefully with a certified financial planner, and it turns out that 65 isn't going to work for what they're doing. Or maybe 62 would work for what they want to do. So when is a big decision to make? You know, uh, especially because it's really hard to go back. We see a lot of people in high paying jobs and, um, and, and uh, significant careers. And often when you leave those positions, it's hard to get hired back if you've made a mistake. Now, I have to tell you, many people um, end up working longer because they do consulting contracts, often for the same job they were doing for the company before, sometimes making more money. But uh, but when, of course, is important. So is it going to be 62? Is it going to be 65? Is it going to be 70? 75? You know, whatever that number works for you, that's fine and good. It gives you a starting point. And it should, of course, be reviewed every year. You're going to hear me talk about this over and over again. But the when is important, of course, because once you stop working, for most people, that significant cash flow stops as well. So if you're used to making $200,000, $300,000, or $100,000 a year, uh, and that spigot's going to stop, then you better make sure that you've got it uh, set up to keep managing your lifestyle off of what you have and what you're planning on coming in. You know, I think back to, we, we met a fellow one time uh, who came to us after a class and um, we taught and he said, I just retired something like I just retired uh, three months ago. Uh, and uh, here's what I want to do. I want to, uh, I want to maintain a house in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. I want to maintain a house in South Carolina and one in Florida. And here are my assets and here are my income. And, and, and the, uh, the return back to him was, you're going to have to find something. Either you've got to give up one of the places or you've got to go back to work. And that, the situation was where he, he just could not replace that income. He couldn't go back to work. Um, so it would have been better for that individual if he would have had that conversation with us six months prior instead of three months later. Uh, he could have made a more informed decision because, again, these are about, this is about decisions. So when, vitally important, seems obvious, but there's a lot to consider there. Where? Where are you going to retire? What's it look like? Um, I had a conversation with, uh, with a client last week, and very happily, I'm, ha I'm so happy for them. They bought a house in South Carolina, and they're talking about Roth conversions. And I said, well, you know, we have to add in state tax. And he said, well, wait a minute. Well, I didn't, I didn't consider that. Well, different rules in different states. So Pennsylvania, we're very fortunate that we don't have any state tax on Roth conversions at this point. New Jersey, up to a level, you don't pay tax on Roth conversions. The level kicks in pretty quickly. But, you know, you've got some room there. There are other states around the country where you don't pay tax on Roth conversions or IRA distributions or pension payments. But there are many, I would say most, where you do, you pay some level of state tax and it could be significant. So I, I told this individual, we should probably plan on about an additional 7% for your Roth conversions for state tax, 7% in tax for these um, Roth conversions. So where is very important. Now, of course, where gets exciting because I want to be near the grandkids or I want to be, you know, in a warmer climate. That's me. I want to, you know, I want to be able to go boating, fishing, whatever. All those things are great and exciting, but you also have to think of the plan effects on that where. So where, just as important as the when. Um, how much? 
How much am I going to need to spend? Again, this seems obvious, but this is so different for everybody. And I have to tell you, in my 20 plus years now of doing this, uh, two, uh, 2012, now 10, 10 years as a certified financial planner and doing intense planning uh, for our clients, uh, most people come in with no idea. Even, you know, I, you've heard me say this for whatever reason, we have a lot of engineers in our practice who are clients. And uh, I don't, you know, I don't advertise to engineers, you know, it's it just, it, they seem to find us. And I love that, by the way, I like, I'm a process oriented person and that makes sense to me. And that's probably the connection there. So the, um, uh, most of our clients will come in and say, here's what I need to spend every year. And I track it on a spreadsheet. Some don't, some say, I, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, we help them find the answer, what they're going to need to spend every year. But even those very detail oriented engineers and doctors who come in with their spreadsheets, I don't think I've ever had a situation where we've said, oh, you were exactly right. <laughs> right. Often they come back most times and probably all the time they come back and they say, uh, you know what? I, uh, I wasn't thinking about this. I wasn't thinking about this and I wasn't thinking about this. Uh, so we've, you know, we've had it where it's a few thousand dollars a month difference. We've had it where it's tens, like $10,000 a month difference or $15,000 a month difference. And that adds up. So how much you're going to need during retirement is vitally important. And you don't use a, that 4% rule. Don't use a 3% rule. Don't use a rule of thumb that anybody puts out there. That's all bogus. Be very, very careful about using just broad brushes in your retirement planning. Find out what your rate of withdrawal should be. Figure out what it should be, you know, what, what your expenses are specifically. If you need help with that, of course, you can reach out to us. But uh, even if you just want to work it out, if you send us an email, um, we, you, we can send you the spreadsheet that we use. Um, I'm happy to do that. Um, and because you have to consider your, your, your spending, of course, and what you want to spend. And then so you have the fun things most of the time, right? Here's the travel we want to do and, um, you know, the, the, the house we want to buy, the boat we want to buy, whatever your, your aspirations are. We're really good, and what you have to what you have to adopt is those other things. Um, you know, the medical costs, inflation, taxes. Of course, taxes is one of your biggest costs during retirement. And you know, hopefully, it's much much smaller for our clients. But uh, most people are just not even considering that. Of course, medical, you hear it all the time about medical costs, but hundreds of thousands of dollars is what you should be setting aside for out-of-pocket costs of medical. I'm not even talking about if, God forbid, you need long-term care. I'm talking about what the average person pays over a lifetime beyond their Medicare. Of course, inflation everybody's talking about inflation now. You know, I had a conversation yesterday with my chiropractor about the price of eggs. Everybody's talking about inflation. So uh, this is, uh, you know, inflation is here forever for sure, just depending on what level it is. It's very, very painful right now. It's, it is, it's hard. It's hard to go into the store and, you know, you used to spend $50 and get a significant amount. Now you, you spend $50. It feels like you get a block of cheese, but the, um, uh, you've got to inflate. There's different inflation for different things. Medical has different inflation. If you're still fund, helping you fund college, maybe you're helping your grandkids. That has a different inflation rate. So you've got to pay attention to these different numbers. So inflation. And I talked about taxes, but I'm going to make this bigger because taxes are huge. So hopefully we can help you make them less of a burden. But there are, of course, your regular taxes, your state tax, your, your federal tax, your local tax. Right. So you all know that I served on the school board for eight years here locally and taxes went up almost every year. We had a couple of years that we could keep them at zero increase, but we got lambasted from some people about that. So it's um, you even it's not just your federal tax, your state tax. You know, I talked about uh, how in Pennsylvania we can do Roth conversions with no tax and I qualified IRA distributions come out without tax and um uh, pension payments come out without tax. That's going to change, folks. That we It's unsustainable. And if you ask any legislator who's being honest with you, at some point, that's got to go away. Uh, phantom taxes. You know, we've got these things that we know about, state tax, local tax, federal tax, but there are also these phantom taxes. You know, Medicare, anybody who's already on Medicare and 
um, has a, a significant portfolio, has to take RMDs or whatever. They've already met their aunt Irma, right? Irma is the income related monthly adjustment amount that you have to pay for um, your Medicare plan if you earn over a certain amount. And those charts are on our website. They'll be up, by the way, the charts on our website will be updated soon. I like to keep the 20, I have the 2023 charts, but I like to keep the 2022 charts up there until about March because people tend to use them for their um, their tax preparation. The uh, we'll, we'll flip it over hopefully by the end of March. Uh, to the 2023, and then we'll be able to do your tax planning for the year. But, you know, we've got these, these costs can be hundreds of dollars a month. Um, often clients of ours are paying them in the short term while they're doing Roth conversions, and they're never paying them again, hopefully, unless the law changes, right? But, um, uh, but they should be paying less over their lifetime. Often that's significantly less, but People, until you hit that age 65 or whenever you start on Medicare, they don't even have this Irma thought in their mind, right? And they also don't think about those out-of-pocket costs. Um, so for the average person, it's $5,000 plus um, a year, and that comes from uh, that comes straight from Medicare. So that's per individual again. So that's another $10,000 a year that you just might not be considering it can be as high as $15,000 a year that you might not be considering. So that's out-of-pocket cost of Medicare. These are these phantom taxes. And then of course, this Irma, how about investment costs? You know, we work really hard in our portfolio to keep investments down, investment costs down as low as possible. Cause I, listen, I realize the drag of that. Um, but you know, not everybody does that. And it's, I was just at a, um, uh, an education event, and we dug into these, some of these investment costs. And I was really surprised to see the net cost effect on just some traditional mutual funds can range four to six percent a year. Um, that is uh, a significant amount. Think about what you have to overcome. So even if even if you're ranging, you know, three to six, call it that, right? But again, some of them are, just blew my mind. Mutual funds. So um, uh, even if it's just three percent. So to earn 10%, of course, you first have to overcome that 3%. You know, we charge, we, you know, we start at 1%. So the, add that on there. Uh, you've got to understand the investment expenses. Uh, of course, as accounts get larger, we reduce our, uh, our fees. But um, uh, as, uh, as your investments grow, you've got to be aware of these expenses because you've got to have a way to overcome them or reduce them. I'm a big fan of reducing them. And there's many ways to do that. How is this funded? Where is our money coming from? Boy, if, if there was a top three questions I get every time I sit down with a new client, uh, and often, you know, as we're in year two, year three with clients, where is this money coming from? How is this funding? Okay, now you've told me. Now I understand how much I need to spend, right? My spending is here. I know when, we're good, I got that. I know where, I know how much we have to spend. Now, where's it coming from? I'm not used to this. I'm used to earning my paycheck. I save some, I spend some. I get that, I understand that change. Now I've got this big bunch of money. Where's it all coming from? That is, uh, that is a big one. And you've got to make these decisions. So the decisions you make, especially early in retirement about where your funds are coming from, can make a significant impact in the life of your retirement. Remember, what you're planning for today is going to have this ripple impact for the next 30, 35 years. Well, of course, some of it could be from income. So whether it's pension, um, Social Security, uh, you might have real estate investments that that pay. You might work part time. You might work part time. So some of that could come from from uh, income. Most people have you know this kind of thing. Investment types. They have some stocks. They have some bonds. They have cash. They might have an annuity or two or more. Um, and these are typically in the form stocks, bonds, and cash are typically in the forms of mutual funds or exchange traded funds. So that's all well and good. And people come to us and they have these big piles of things all over the place. And they're working with somebody for the last 30 years. And that person has done a good job of taking them from point A 
all the way up to point B, and they've had a lot of growth in their accumulation years. Now they're at point B, so this has been 40 years, let's say, and now they say, well, point C over here, uh, let's see, I'm going to put it over here and we're going to cross over. Point C over here is when I'm no longer here, right? Rest in peace. So for the next 30 some years, 30 to 35 years, maybe plus, I've got to figure out where this is all coming from, the stocks, bonds, and cash, and it's all kind of just this mesh. I got different accounts all, there, all over a different place. Uh, you know, how does this all come together? So that's a really, really important decision. You've heard me talk about asset allocation, principal protection, the account segmentation. This is where that plan and the account segmentation comes in. Because again, what you really want, folks, is you want to start with retirement and go back to that uh, no longer here and have that plan instead of just one big mesh of stocks, bonds, and cash, annuities, real estate, gold, silver, whatever your investments are saying, okay, this is going to cover me. Let's hope it works. You know, and, you're, and the professionals saying, trust us, we have a lot of great tools to show, show us the ebbs and flows in the market, and we, we stress test them and use this sophisticated Monte, Car Monte Carlo uh, scenarios that, that, you know, are based on uh, nuclear physics, and that's all true, right? But that's just really falling back to trust us. So, you know, really what you want is you want I now you've identified, you know, when, where, how much money you need. Now you just say, okay, I need this much money here. I need this much money here. I need this much money here. And I need this much money here. And you develop a plan for each segment. This is when I'm talking about account segmentation. You plan, you, you, you don't have one big account or, you know, an IRA account, a non-qualified account, a non-IRA account because they're taxed differently. That's important, right? But you've got to know where the money's flowing from because they have to be invested in the right things, right? The right investments and also at the right risk levels. Because if this is years zero to three, and I didn't draw this out, years four to six, years seven to nine, and I know you folks have seen this before, but I, it's so important. Years 10 to 13, for example, and 13 plus years, all these, all these pie charts have to be invested differently. All these separate accounts, and that yes, they must be separate accounts because psychologically, you have to understand that when the market drops 40%, your cash flow for the next three years is barely affected if affected at all. Where the volatility you're seeing is in the 13 plus years. So that's what keeps people invested because you need, you need these longer term investments to, to hedge off inflation. And it also gives the people comfort to enjoy their retirement. So it's all great to know what investment types, but you got to know where they sit too. I hope that's helpful. And then of course we have the tax treatment. So you've got your buckets. You all know these buckets by now, right? You've got your taxable. So you, you're all getting 1099s from your taxable bucket. So any 1099 that doesn't have the letter R under it comes from the taxable bucket. And sometimes this is significant money that comes out of here. And what happens there, you have to pay tax on it. And then you have your tax deferred bucket. And these are IRAs, traditional IRAs, traditional 401ks, other retirement plans that you haven't paid tax on yet and you're promising to pay tax later. And then you have your tax-free bucket. Tax-advantaged or tax-free. And that's anything Roth and some forms of ca properly structured cash value life insurance. So anything that comes out of here is tax-free. Uh, there, there can be some requirements on that, of course, but anything out of here, the center bucket, you've got to pay tax on later. So you've got to have that. another vital decision is how much money is in each bucket. And there is an ideal amount, as you know, for each of these buckets, right? It should be six months to one year of expenses in this bucket and you can, if you can keep money in this tax deferred bucket, it is an amount that, that generates a required minimum distribution that is below your standard deduction so that any distributions that come out of here are tax free. Now, that doesn't work for everybody because you might have pensions and real estate investments and, and, and too much money over here. But for, for some people, you can leave $250,000, $300,000, sometimes $500,000 in your tax-deferred bucket and never pay tax on it. So be careful about getting too aggressive with your conversions 
and making the wrong decision. So that is a vital decision. So we can move money over here and build up. We want, ideally you want everything, right? Everything that's, that doesn't meet these minimums, minimum amounts in this tax-free bucket. So anything that comes out of here is 0% tax. Another vital decision. Now, the last one here is your legacy. So you got to ask if there is a legacy. You might want to spend it all. You might, you might say, I want to have $1 left when I'm no longer above ground. That's fine. What typically happens when we go through that account segmentation process, taking you back to here, we end up here. I'm going to make this green just to make it a little easier to see. We end up here with a column of money that is what we call legacy longevity. And listen, this could be, what if this is a million dollars? And you might say, I want to die with one, $1 left, you know, when I'm no longer here. Um, and that might be fine. And that's, that might be a good plan for you. But if we show you that, hey, you know, it, you've met, we're meeting all your needs here, invest it the way we should be. And then you've got a million dollars left here that will likely, you'll, you won't need during your lifetime. Now you can pull it out of there if you find things that you want to do with it, right? So you spend that money down, um, whether it's medical costs or just fun, whatever you want to do, um, or it could go to your legacy, whatever that is. So the, another great thing about the account segmentation is it identifies if there is that legacy longevity portion and what that is, because you can imagine it, if we typically have this being the most aggressive allocation. So if this averaged, even if an average 7% a year, that million dollars is going to double every 10.2 years. So you, you could easily go from a million dollars to three plus million dollars over your the, the life of your retirement. Uh, and many times that's many multiples over that. So you got to figure out how much is in your legacy longevity portion. And then, um, uh, so if you're going to have a legacy, what is it? And then if you have money left over, if you don't spend it all until, you know, that last dollar on the day you die, uh, who does it go to? You know, does it go to family, friends, charity? This is all very important because there are different uh, strategies for each one of these. Let's just talk charity. When somebody tells me that they're charitably inclined and say they have $3 million in an IRA and we do all the projections and we show that a million dollars is likely in that legacy longevity and they say, well, you know, I'd like to, I don't have any children. I'm a single person. I don't have any children or, you know, it's just the two of us and we don't have any kids, whatever the situation is. We want it to go to this charity. If there's really that million dollars left there, Mark, we want that this to go to this charity. Well, we wouldn't even consider converting that to a Roth IRA if it's going to go to a charity. Why would I pay tax on something for a client or have a client pay tax? I don't pay tax for clients. Don't, don't take that the wrong way. But why would I have clients pay tax on something that no one's ever going to have to pay tax on, right? Now, if they had to draw it out and use it during their lifetime in a, in a um, uh, you know, some kind of medical situation or something, that's a different story. But let's say that that's earmarked towards charity, they can give that during their lifetime or they can leave it at their legacy and pay no tax. That's why that is another key decision to make. You can't make these decisions without having all the information. You have to go through the plan and go through these processes. But do you see how that's important? Family and friends is different too because, hey, listen, you might want to help them have a, a tax, tax free or a tax efficient transfer of that money, right? Because we, we know, folks, that taxes are only going up. All the studies we show is that by 2030, your average middle-class American is going to be in a 40 to 45% effective tax rate. And that's a lot more than it is today. And then how, of course. So we have if, who, and how. How does it all transfer? Are we using, um, are we doing it during a lifetime? Are we doing a gifting strategy? Are we waiting till we, we die? Are we doing it in a trust? Are we just doing bequests? There's a lot of hows there. That's really where you need your team. You need your certified financial planner. You need your qualified estate attorney, probably an elder law attorney. You know, those two being can be the same person. Your CPA. How does that all work? Once you've identified it, right, that funnels down. Okay, we've got what we need. Now we've got this legacy. It's going to happen, right? You're, you're going to die at some point. How does it all transfer over? You need the help and the um, the uh, 
the tools to make that decision. You can't make the decision without the information. These are cr critical pieces of information to help you make these decisions better. And then, so the hows, very, very important. So trusts uh, in life, after, after death, uh, bequests, whichever works best for you. Life insurance. Then the why. Why is this part of the uh, retirement planning process? Well, I've already told you because what if you have $1 million in your legacy longevity segment? Um, wouldn't it be helpful to know that? Wouldn't it be terrible if you go through this Roth conversion process, tried to do it on your own, and you said, I have $3 million in my IRA. I'm going to convert it all before the end of uh, um, 2030 because I've read the books. I've heard, I've, I've listened to Mark's webinars. You know, uh, his, his colleague Ed Slot, David McKnight, says that we should convert it. And there's a million dollars that you never had to convert. So listen, even if you're fortunate and you're, you're, um, you're, you're in a, you maintain a 20% effective tax rate, it's $200,000 that you never had to spend, and that would be terrible. So there's a lot of whys around it, but that's the why of why it's important that make this decision in the retirement planning process, not the estate planning process. Everybody thinks about a legacy as a estate plan, but it's also vitally important in your retirement plan. All right, folks, that wraps up today. Uh, that was a good um, uh, long session. So we're at 1056. Um, I look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar. It will not be next week. I'm out of town next week. So our next webinar will be the following Tuesday. Uh, but I hope this was helpful. If uh, if you're just tuning in or if you tuned in just for this segment, please subscribe and uh, like and hit the notification button and all those things you do on YouTube. Um, if, uh, if you have questions, send them to me. Uh, if you want a copy of our spreadsheet, um, send me an email and we'll get it out to you. If you want to schedule time to meet with us to go over your key questions, your five, not four, but key retirement questions, have to schedule time to do that. Just email us at questions at attleboroughwealth.com. That's questions at attleboroughwealth.com. We got a lot coming up for this year. It's really going to be an exciting year. It's kind of overwhelming because we have so much planned, but you know, we've got uh, classes, two classes scheduled already. We've got a few more scheduled for the rest of the year. We've got some really great people who have joined our firm that are going to be running classes and um, helping us out. And then we've got Dave, Dave McKnight, uh, March 1st on our uh, special webinar, our first special webinar of the year. We've got Dave and uh, Ed Slot, kind of the dream team on May 16th live in the Newtown Theater. So I don't know where you are, but if you can make it here, that would be great. I know some of you from around the country, but listen, fly in for this. <laughs> it will be really worth your time. If you're close by for crying out loud, don't miss it. Um, you know, we do some light catering and, uh, you know, if you're still hungry after this catering, I'd be shocked. But um, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, leave me some comments. Uh, send me some emails. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you think about the studio. Let me know what you think about the YouTube format. Let me know if you think it's great. If it stinks, I appreciate all the feedback. Folks, have a great week and we'll see you in two weeks, not next week, but two weeks. Take care now.